What's up, everybody? My name is David Parsons. Welcome to another episode of The Nostalgia Trap. I appreciate your business, uh, and I thank you for listening to the show. I do want to start today by bugging you a little bit, if you will indulge me for a second, because I'm a little bit in in an emergency in terms of the podcast, and hopefully not in terms of my larger existence. But, uh, you know, I moved to California this summer, and the, the, the employment situation is not too great here. So doing the podcast has become, you know, it was always a kind of a luxury for me to pay for it, and I always had the money to pay for it, but I'm more and more not in the position to do that. I need donations to my Patreon. I, that's the only way I can imagine keeping the podcast going. So if you enjoy these conversations and, and you think that they're they're worth it, and I you know if I can toot the the podcast horn a little bit, you know I've been doing uh, interviews with radical academics, writers, and and other such folks for a few years now. I feel like there are not a lot of outlets for these kinds of conversations, particularly with Marxist academics who are talking about their path to uh, radical left politics and how that history, that personal history fits into the larger history of the U.S. and the place we're in now. So, you know, I feel like these uh, these conversations are really important, but I also have always felt from the beginning that I didn't want to advertise on this show. It's kind of weird to have like a Marxist show that we talk about how much I hate capitalism and particularly you know, Peter Sabatino, who's a producer of the show and does such a great job like putting together the the sounds of this show, you know, both of us kind of came up with this really, really harsh uh, hatred, cynical hatred of, of consumer capitalism, in particular, the kind of psychological manipulation of advertising. We hate it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of advertising, advertising the show right now, but there's something really sick about the way that, that all that works, and I think both of us find that distasteful. So Patreon is kind of like the only way that I could see, I could feel like ethically and morally right about asking for money. Um, I don't want to advertise products on the show and that kind of shit. So, you know, that this is, this is where I'm at. So if you have it in your heart and in your wallet and your ability, you know, I don't have... I don't have, I certainly don't have, you know, a bunch of money to give to podcasts right now, but, and I understand if you don't, uh, but if you do listen to the show and you do find it valuable, now is the time to pitch in to help it because it is becoming really hard uh, for me to keep doing this and, and travel around and talk to professors and put this show up without a lot of support. So that is at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. If you go to that, uh, that website, patreon.com slash nostalgia trap you can google it or you can put in that address there's a button that says become a patron and you can decide you know how much money you want to give a month it could be a buck it could be two bucks it could be five bucks it could be ten bucks any of that helps honestly because it shows me that people want the show and the, and it gives me a little bit of a little bit of space and, and money and resources to be able to keep doing it which is what i i really want to do I, there's so many uh, there are so many people that i want to talk to here in uh, here in California, but also, you know, I'm continuing to talk to academics on the East Coast, and I've finally got my my phone rig up to the point where it sounds like I can have good conversations with people on the phone, so I'm excited about that. But I want to keep doing it, and if you can help me in any way, that would really, really, really be appreciated. So uh, patreon.com slash nostalgia trap, and I'll shut up about that now, but I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Today, my guest is someone I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, um, his name is uh, Professor Nelson Lichtenstein. He is a professor of history at the University of California, Santa Barbara. That's where I went to school. I was there. Um, you know, I was a history major for a little bit, and then I was a film studies major there. From I was there on that campus between 1996 and 2000, which seems like a totally other world to me now in every way, both personally and uh, historically, politically. Um, but but Professor Lichtenstein is uh, also the di- director for at the uh, Center for the Study of Work, Labor, and Democracy. I kind of first came to his work in graduate school. I read uh, his book Labor's War at Home, but I also ca- you know read his uh, his work in a series of books called Who Built America, uh, which is put together by the American Social History Project at the Graduate Center. Uh, the director of which is uh, named Josh Brown, who's been a guest on this show and was. Uh, also the director of my dissertation and my advisor in graduate school and uh, a a wonderful historian in his own right. So, you know, Professor Lichtenstein talked to me about all sorts of stuff. We we talked about the who built America and and that kind of the the history of labor in this country. But, uh, you know, I I wanted to talk to him about his personal history and and his his time at uh, at Berkeley during the 
the revolution of the free speech movement in the early 60s and the mid 60s. I mean, we talked about Walmart, we talked about all sorts of stuff. This was a really, really fun conversation. So I wanted to thank him for joining me. And again, I hope you enjoy these conversations. You can find more Nostalgia Trap stuff at patreon.com slash Nostalgia Trap. And if you are able to, I would really, really appreciate it at this moment. Uh, if you could consider giving a little bit of money to the show, because I want to keep putting up episodes, I really want to keep doing it. But life is hard, and as you know, you know, uh, capitalism, the system, the man, whatever you call that, however you understand that, I'm really feeling it in my life right now uh, as I try to rebuild my life and my career as a teacher here in California. Um, things are happening, but you know, it, it also takes time, and so the, it would really help boost the podcast and keep it going if you could donate a little bit of money to the show. So thank you so much. Enjoy this episode. This is me talking to Professor Nelson Lichtenstein. All right, so there are a million reasons why I want to talk to you today. Um, I think, you know, when I was reading the, the, the introduction to a contest of ideas that about your, your you, you kind of go through a little bit of your life there. What was striking me a little bit about you is that you work, live and work in this era of, uh, you know, labor history in which labor actually changes a lot over the course of your work. Um, I guess what I wanted to ask you just to start is when you were growing up and you were young, did you have any inkling that you would be a labor historian? Were there signs in your youth that that would be where you were headed? Or how did you relate to the idea of labor when you were young? Yeah, good question. I mean, I grew up in a small town, uh, uh, Frederick, Maryland. Uh, my father was a merchant there and a refugee from, from Germany. He was a social democrat. My, my mother was a refugee from Vicksburg, Mississippi <laughs> uh, to the north. Uh, uh, mm. I remember uh, as a kid, I, I mean, there, there was no sense of a labor movement around um, uh, this place when I grew up. But I do remember uh, as a kid reading or somewhere about the, the sit-down strikes in, in Flint and think, wow, that was exciting, you know. Mm. So I just remember that as a kind of, as a, uh, a moment. Uh, but no, the, the answer is that I didn't. And my early passions po um, politically were sit with the civil rights movement, obviously. Mm. Uh, really, even before I was a um, um, a uh, uh, college student, uh, I do remember I did have one insight that was uh, helped to help me be get interested, which we're all interested today, the nature of conservatism mm. and conservatism inside the working class. Frederick, Maryland, was the um, site of the Army's Bacteriological Warfare Center. <laughs> Fort Dietrich, yeah, <laughs> uh, and now I think it's sort of a cancer center. But anyway, uh, but it was it was bacteriological warfare, okay, straight out, and mm. <laughs> and this was a, a, a big operation. And of course, all my friends and and the, and the smartest kids and coolest kids in, in high school were had their parents worked there, you know, right? And right. It, had, it had the best Boy Scout troop and the and the best uh, <laughs> swimming pool, so. In the late 50s, when I was, I must have been just probably in junior, junior high, the Quakers from Philadelphia came down to Frederick and they had a year-long picket line, a little one, you know, a vigil really, outside of Fort Dietrich obviously well I was a townie I was a local I, I was like <laughs> some southern you know and we resented like you know and we I remember I remember at the time think you know resenting these outsiders who came in it's funny and so in later years I, I reflected back on that and thinking okay that's sort of the mentality of, of kind of the opposition you know and, and I was part of that for a moment you know well you mentioned your uh <laughs> both your parents kind of being refugees in some sense with your father being a refugee <laughs> for, literally from Nazi Germany right, right? and right. Um, how much? How much did that you think affect like your sense of like your sense of social justice well, and all that kind of thing? It seems like it would trick a lot. Well, of that. obviously, yes, it did. It, it, he was a social democrat, and and that you know, and he. Uh, but again, the, the the all of politics were channeled through through the civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I remember mm -hmm. my father as a uh, uh, just as a, you know giving money to to core. Congress yeah. of Racial Equality and to the NAA. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're, you know, that long-standing Jewish uh, kind of even uh, uh, immigrant uh, kind of connection with that. It was yeah. there. Yeah. And, my, and my mother, by the, who was, who literally was, I mean, from 
when I grew up, the, growing up, the first politician I ever heard of in my life was Theodore Bilbo, hmm. who was the the racist, horrible senator from Mississippi. Who, who my mother was just like literally, I want to be away from all of that. You yeah, know? And I don't so want to she, live in the same state. Right, yeah. So, so she she uh, uh, was was you know clearly. Um, uh, hostile to that to that sort of stuff. So that that was a strong that was a strong impulse in my in my youth. And um, although I have to just just to say just kind of you kind of funny the I'm not I'm not a um, a kind of um, how should I put it um, it didn't all work out perfectly. So for example, mm-hmm. uh, when the march on Washington took place in nineteen in the August of nineteen sixty three, right, which I was well aware of. I knew exactly what it was. I totally was in support of it. Uh, Frederick, Maryland is like 50 miles away, you know. Mm-hmm. I did not go on the March on Washington. Hmm. Why? I was a was a 17 or 18 year old youth. Uh, let's let's drive to the West Coast. And, and, I mean, this was sort of like an exciting, you know, kind of youthful yeah, thing. So there yeah. was kind of these impulses. I was not like a a, a dedicated, uh, you know, uh, red diaper baby. I wasn't a red diaper baby. I was I wasn't I wasn't you know in that kind of almost uh, Bolshevik sense. You know, I wasn't mm. you know. So I mean, I've always regretted that. Regretted my entire life. But but in a way, it 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 it, it sort of indicates the happenstance of political commitments. You know that. And it, that, may, yeah, it, it makes sense to me too. I mean. Uh, what, what was what would have been going on on the West Coast that would have drawn you there oh, in 1963? It was just exciting to well, it was just exciting to let's be on my own for yeah. the first time, yeah. get, get away, you know, kind of take off with a with a kind of buddy and you know go to the you know that sort of thing. I mean, later on, of course, uh, when uh, I, I, Berkeley things happened at Berkeley, and yeah, I yeah, that's Ber- what I was thinking about because right. but the free speech movement is what 1964, Four, right? 64, yeah. And so, is it really the free speech movement that would have caught your attention in, oh, for, at Berkeley? It definitely did. Oh, it definitely. Did. I was at I was at, went to Dartmouth College. I was on the school paper, uh, and Dartmouth was pretty sleepy and isolated in those days. And yeah, I remember remember very much. Oh yes, the Berkeley free speech movement was very exciting to me. Mm-hmm. He, he, reading about it, you know, he, and I thought uh, actually, but but I and I chose to go to Berkeley. I mean, obviously, the free speech movement was a big plus, but also at that time, the uh, Berkeley history faculty had. Uh, a, a number of, of excellent uh, historians, world famous historians on questions of race. Uh, uh, Kenneth St- Stamp, yep. uh, Winthrop Jordan, um, George Stocking, who mm-hmm. did a lot of work on th- theories of race. Uh, there's many, many people there. I think there were, anyway, so that was a, a big plus to come to Berkeley. So that was what also drew me there. Um, and, uh, and did you apply, did you apply to, to go to graduate school at Berkeley? Yeah, ba- right? graduate school at Berkeley. Yeah. Okay, so when did you arrive there? I arrived there in the um, fall of 1966. 1966. Wow. Yeah. So that's like you know I've watched I've watched this this documentary Berkeley in the 60s. Yes, it's, so yes. many times. It's pretty I've, good. Yeah. Yeah, I've watched it. I mean, I show it to my students all the right. time. So I feel like right. yeah. it's weird because it, right. on the one sense I feel like I have a really great sense of what it was like there, but mm-hmm. I also it's all from that movie. There's <laughs> certainly other things that went on. Well, when you were when I mean you were a graduate student at Berkeley in sixty yes. six, mm-hmm. uh, already pursuing history. Yes, yes, I was in his, I was in the history department. Did you, know. you have a sense of like that you were going to be part of this kind of revolutionary thing that was going on at Berkeley, or were you oh was, yeah, I, yes, I wanted to be. Yeah, I definitely wanted to be part of it. I, how to to do it exactly was another question, but you know, I definitely wanted to be. That's one of the reasons I I, I went there. I wanted to be part of that that movement that that what was going on and. Uh, very strongly. Now, now it took me a couple of years to sort of figure out exactly, you know, how I would uh, my posture. And uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I basically. <laughs> I what do to, you mean by your posture? Well, my yeah. political, which was particular political orientation yeah. that I would take. Yeah. And it was, and I do think it was very, uh, uh, you know, exciting. You come on to come on the campus of go through Slather Gate. And you know the, the, all these tables and all the and kind of a, a, a marketplace of really ideas, literally. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, I, okay, who's putting out the most sophisticated leaflet today? You know, and it turned out uh, to be the International Socialists, which I which I joined. <laughs> this was this Shackmanite Trotskyist group, which which has had um, went on. I mean, among its later uh, manifestations, it really was the group behind uh, Labor Notes, which has really been in existence for almost forty years, and and also. Part of the animating uh, 
uh, push behind uh, Teamsters for Democratic Union, which is also in existence for many, many mm-hmm. years, uh, and other things. So that that was the group that I gravitated to, and, and you know went around, uh, and I found it. I found it. Uh, that was a real education. That's what I got. That's what I was going to ask. Did you know a lot about kind of? I, I mean, I think if people get confused now, I, I think rightfully so about all the kind of different factions of sure. Marxism and Leninism and Trotskyism and all that kind of stuff. Was that something that you were learning as you were? Oh doing? yes, of course. Yeah. And, and I mean, and there were distinctions, and I think. For example, the Russian question, you know, yes. was in fact, did in fact open it itself up to, to understanding a lot about uh, the way the world works, the politics, the way bureaucracies work, the way, the way, you know, the way the Russian question was not just an antiquarian issue. I mean, it, what it meant was, what is the nature of that regime? You know, and yes. you had to come to a position and, you know, you could you could slice and dice it pretty, pretty, you know, was it state capitalist? Was it bureaucratic collectivist? Was it? Uh, degenerated worker state, et cetera, et cetera. All this today may seem a little um, uh, uh, beside the point, but I think it. I think it, people are still arguing. This no, stuff, I think no, I, yeah, no I, and, I, and I think it gave it insight. What is the nature? Like, what is the nature of our regime? Yeah, neoliberal. Uh, you know, sure. Uh, You've whatever. heard this term tanky, though. Have you heard this term tanky? Like tankies are like uh, no. leftists that are very. They're still very defensive about the Soviet Union. No, <laughs> I've never. No, I didn't yeah. know they existed. Yes, <laughs> uh, um, and they'll yeah. and they will defend the regime to till really? the end. And really? Uh, well, uh, um, well, yeah, well, and they're yeah. hated by other leftists. And, no, no, that I don't know. That yeah, I probably you, don't know. You don't want to go into these little. Twitter no, no, circles no, no, online no, no, of the, no. <laughs> uh, but I mean, no, but yeah, the, those tensions are still around. Yeah. The, the the Berkeley experience was, I mean, was was great, and I, I now I've had my own grad students and, and and generations of grad students, and I and I, uh, you know, when I hear that my grad students, oh, we have a Marxist study group, or you know, sorry, wait, I couldn't do that reading, we were off at a demonstration, I think. Okay, that's where I really learn stuff. You know, that's what yeah. I. That's right. More than this learning in an abstract way, a kind of you, a commitment plus learning. That's what you want, and that and that solidifies your 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 worldview for 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 decades. And uh, I mean, I would say that mm-hmm. my my mm-hmm. my political perspective over time has moved from a kind of um, um, what would I say? A kind of more um, uh, not. A, I was never. A, I was never a kind of. Uh, I never thought revolution was around the corner or something, but I mean, <laughs> but I but I have moved to a kind of okay. I am a social democrat. <laughs> all right, right, I am. All right, and no no apologies. I'm a social democrat. Right, right. That's it. I'm not, I don't I don't I don't <laughs> say that with a kind of nasty. Oh, you're just a social democrat. No, I, I'm not, okay, I'm a social democrat. That's what I am. Yeah, I, I'm just a social. Democrat. Yeah, right. I don't it's say that. Self demeaning. I, right? I don't say that. I, I I am a and so that's taken a few <laughs> decades to say. And uh, well, that seems like it was tied up with your work too. Yeah, right? sure. I mean, yeah, right. is this something yeah. that's happening at Berkeley where you're? Are, how are you thinking of? Well, you well, know the relationship between your academic work and what's going on around. Well, you. right. As yeah. I've I've written other places, but yeah. So what at that moment in '69 and '70 when I was engaged in in um, my political group, and we you know we did all sorts of things. You know, anti-war demonstrations, and you know uh, we were involved in student strikes. You know, and against you know against the war in Vietnam and such. Um, but one of the things that that all the new left, the entire new left, uh, you know this from your work. Uh, you know, the turn to the work working class, you know, right. in basically 69 and 70. And I remember um, th- we were having debates uh, within our group. What should we do? Okay. Uh, one group said, okay, let's all go to, let's go to the Detroit, you know, Chicago, you know, Cleveland and, and, you know, industrialize, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And then others would say, well, no, we should become school teachers in Los Angeles. And, you know, this is sort of, or, uh, or um, service sector hospitals and things, and, and mm-hmm. that turned out, you know, that that's where the you know the new working class is. And so we had that debate. Many people did did end up going to Detroit. But then the question: What do you do when you get there? Right, okay. right. What do you do when you get there? So at that time, um, the memory of, uh, of of wildcat strikes in World War II, the mm-hmm. the what was currently happening in Italy and Great Britain, you know, with the shop stewards movement, and, and you know things were happening. Be, you know there so the i remember the basically the, the debate was well you know you wouldn't want to you know you want to form an oppositional 
formation inside the unions, inside the workplace against the against the trade unions, mm-hmm, and you know, mm-hmm. and you know this, and then the, the memory and the history of the Wildcat Strike Movement and the No Strike Pledge and the and that mo- in World War II, it kind of when when the the, the un- when the unions were kind of statified, and maybe that's now become a permanent thing. So that I'm I'm in the back of the room. I'm not I'm not participating in the debate because everyone else was much more sophisticated than I was okay, right, right. on this question. Okay, uh, including for example Hal Draper. Who had worked in a you know or, or Stan Weir? These are people who had worked in mm-hmm. in the shops and in the in the in the during the war. Um, so, but I thought, oh, I think I should write it. I'll write about that. I, I'll investigate the history of the of what was going on in World War II. So that was where I, my dissertation and first book came from: Labor's War yeah. at Home, yep, which was about uh, the, the CIO, uh, the CIO, World War II, and, right? and 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 it has two aspects to it. One aspect is the is the relationship of the leadership and the institution to the state mm. uh, and, you know, period of war. And the other is the sort of social uh, history of the, of the uh, revolt from below, of the, of the, of the wildcat strikes, yeah. which I, which I, which I, I uh, celebrated and privileged uh, uh, in that first book. Um, you know, Reagan, uh, you know, like a lot of other labor historians, Reagan was, you know, hit you over the head with a two by four. Right, right. <laughs> and basically, you know, after Reagan, it took a little while to filter down. But OK, hey, the institutional trade union movement is in is in jeopardy. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. OK, what do we do there? And there were some people who said, OK, good, you know, get rid of it. I mean, we'll start anew. But obviously, most people thought, ah, you know. Uh, we have to rethink, you know, the the uh, the nature of these unions. It was an assumption. I would say this that, mm. and I interviewed Clark Kerr, for example, once, uh, not on of the free speech movement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I and and I went very specifically. By the time I interviewed him in the early eighties, I I didn't ask him about the free speech movement. Yeah, yeah. I asked him about his life as an industrial relations person. That's right, scholar. That's which right. He, which yeah. is really that was his that was his academic uh, world. And, and in in the movie, just to go back to my yeah. knowledge from the, the movie, he he they show. A clip of him speaking and he talks about kind of like the knowledge industry and right. that being the future yes. of uh industrial yeah. relations right. in america yeah so i mean someone like kerr i mean and actually subsequent to that i've, I've followed I've, I've done work on him and i've had other people i know i mean clark kerr who of course was the was the great bet noir of this free speech movement and, and properly so and rightly so he was he was demagogic and, and, and <laughs> horrible hor- hor- about it but on the other hand he was being attacked by ronald reagan and the and the fbi and uh and and his conception of a modern society which was that the unions play a functional role mm-hmm. in modern capitalism they aren't revolutionary they aren't a challenge but they're functional to it and therefore uh, it's appropriate for you know the university and the big corporations and the unions to have this sort of co- corporatist compact you know uh, i mean it sounds like gompers well yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the right didn't who wasn't going to buy that right, <laughs> and, the, right. and increasingly they weren't going to buy that so therefore uh, kerr was you know being investigated by the by the fbi etc and and 30 years later by the 90s when the university is under attack uh, for fiscal reasons, Mario Savio, the leader of the free speech movement, yeah. and Clark Kerr are metaphorically on the same side of the barricades. Which is know. so poetic yeah. and so great because it's like, you know, yeah. it's it, it's very easy to think of Clark Kerr, especially thinking just the free speech movement as a, uh, you know, a, a, a fascist villain in the eyes of all the students who are, you yeah. know. I, I should say that this is funny. <laughs> so that, the story is yeah. a little more complicated right, right. than that. So yeah. it's very funny. So in the midst of the uh, fiscal crisis here in 2009, uh, well, all throughout California, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, one of my very, very, very best students and great student, she's now a professor, uh, Elizabeth Shermer, who, who wrote a very good book on the rise of the right in, in, in Phoenix. She was the uh, valedictorian uh, for the grad students. And we, I remember we sat in the, in my basement and trying to figure out what posture should we write, take in terms of her, you know, writing about Clark Kerr. Right, know? right. You know, and we sort of did it, okay, we, we aren't going to give this guy a complete pass, you know. Right, right, of course. <laughs> you know? But, you know, but so, I mean, and she gave her, and she devoted part of her speech to, to Clark Kerr and... Uh, and uh, what he would have done, uh, you know, at this moment. So That's it was, it was great. a lot of fun. A lot of fun. You know? That's great. Hello. Hi. Hello. 
This is this is uh, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm David. How are you? David. Oh, yeah. He's the nice Eileen, to meet you. Uh, yeah. And we're gonna see some more David. I'm gonna he's gonna come. He just <laughs> moved to Ventura, so we're gonna see some more. So you edit that. So, out. So yeah. Um, I, I, just to go back to the I'm sure. thinking about you at Berkeley and doing um yeah. labor stuff and thinking about writing about you know World War II and the yeah. the, the, the state's relation to labor in World War II. Yeah. It makes me think of Viet, the Vietnam War going on at the same time. Was that something well, that was sure. in your mind I'm, as you were writing? And and did you anticipate that? I mean, how, what was labor's place in the Vietnam Well, Vietnam obviously, yeah. obviously, and the fact that the AFL-CIO was the staunch supporters of the Vietnam War. That's right. And they remained, they remained, I mean, they were like some of the last uh, elements of the, po- of the uh, body politic to, to finally switch on, on Vietnam. Uh, you know, the, the George Meany, the anti-communism. That's right. Uh, that went on for a long time. And of course, I... We followed very closely the opposition movements within the labor movement, mm-hmm. especially the UAW, uh, uh, and um, you know we, we were you know tried to support that and boost that. I remember that you know very very well. Um, so we were um, uh, so I, I got in so I got into labor. I, re- I remember the 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 incident, the moment. I mean, this is sort of the the moment on September fourteenth, nineteen seventy. Um, the first strike by the auto workers against General Motors in 25 years was set to begin, mm. and it did begin. So we went down to the giant, then Fremont plant of General Motors. Today, Elton Musk has it or something. Yeah, you know, right, right. You know. But anyway, we went down there, and like the strike was designed, it was supposed to begin at midnight, but we got down there about 9:30 or 10, and we had our our hand printed signs, you know, which were much better than the UAW's official plans. I, I mean, the, the official signs, this just shows, I thought this, I thought this captured the bureaucratization, not just of the institution, but of their mind. So the, of their ideas. So the UAW sign said, we demand equity. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> Whereas the, we students had, you know, GM mark of exploitation. Yeah, anyway, right. <laughs> in this, so in this moment, um, and I think I was probably at that very moment just formulating my dissertation proposal. Uh, the workers somehow got wind that there were all these Berkeley radicals hanging out you know, mm. outside the mm-hmm. plant, and they came pouring out of the plant. I mean, and the point was they wanted to begin the strike themselves. Yeah. You know, an yeah. hour and a half or right. two hours before the official strike. Right. Pouring out of the plant, um, they took our signs and held them up, and, and I think they even destroyed. Uh, a, a little uh, entrance kiosk, you know, or broke the window in it. And then there was a kind of a rally. And okay. So the next day in the papers, the day after in the papers, Paul Schrade, who was one of the most left wing UAW officials around, I mean, I later got to know him. I know that for a fact. He was a <laughs> staunch supporter of Cesar Chavez, an, an anti war activist, et cetera. Okay. Paul Schrade, California, very famous f- figure in California, uh, liberal labor. He comes out with a headline. UA, uh, Berkeley students, you know, <laughs> disrupt, you know, wow. you yeah. know, and said, you know, and they are, the, the, you know, and that just said to me, okay, there's something going on here, kind of institutionally, that is that is, you know, created this conservatism in the union movement. Yeah, and it's kind of like uh, the workers seem like they're up for grabs in some, in some yes, respects. Yes, yeah, and I yeah. think yes, yes, and I mean this moment, right? I think that's a good good point that clearly, I mean, all the the the, the last several decades of history in which the, uh, the, 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 the at least the part of the white working class has moved to the right. Um, right, the, the, this moment, uh, yeah, we thought that the, the working class could, could renew its its radical, you know, potential, and right. absolutely, and, and and as a consequence, we're reading, obviously, we're reading E.P. Thompson, you know, mm-hmm, and later mm-hmm. later we're reading uh, 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 Dave Montgomery, and we're, we're reading uh, you know, Gutman, and they're writing about the 19th century or something. But but you know, we're we're look we're we're looking for that in the in the 20th century. There's no doubt that that's the impulse, of course, behind all of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was, was going to ask you about that because I don't know if you if you've heard of this uh, book by Penny Lewis, called Hard Hats, Hippies, and Hawks. It's a it's about kind of the Vietnam War and how the Vietnam War is kind of used as a lever to kind of like yeah. move the working class during that during that era. And she kind of counters the idea that the working class was this kind of like monolith of pro-war yeah, well, sure. sentiment. That that sure. in fact the working class was so deeply connected to the Vietnam War because it was their children that were going there um, and that there was a lot more complicated than the idea that Nixon was trying to push that, like, all the hard hats are, are conservative. No, unquestion- yeah. unquestionably, it, it, it's, there's a kind of division divisions within it. Uh, it's, it's just a kind of a symbolic uh, uh, 
uh, the hard hat, the hard hat as the icon of a conservative workers, but that was just a that was both manipulated to begin with from from on high, either from top union leaders or Nixon, and it clearly didn't represent the entire working class. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. the, I think it was Josh Freeman who once quipped to me. I don't know if he ever wrote this. He said, "Well, you know, the '60s finally came to the working class in the 1970s." You know, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah. And I think, and I think that was that was true. And then, of course, also this was the period. Um, of Lordstown, and there were there was this sort of Indian summer of, mm. of militancy, uh, which was genuine, and you know, in terms of unauthorized strikes and and just regular in, authorized in the seventies, yeah, in the, yeah, yeah, in the up to, up to the up to the recession, and just through the recession, there was this was a Indian summer of um, of uh, you know labor militancy, both official and unofficial. I mean, this was mm. a, if you look at the you know the. the the graphs. This is many, many, many strikes yeah, in this period, yeah. up to the middle of the 1970s, um, and even even later on. Um, and there have been some recent books. Uh, Lane Windham has written a new book on on that on that militancy in the 1970s. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so all of this is the environment within which I'm writing labor history. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, right. Did you anticipate um, the coming of of deindustrialization being? Be, the, changing the way that people work in America is that something that uh, is something that I, I feel like was was noticed maybe in in the seventies and eighties. No, well, well, early on we could we could see this. I mean, for example, I remember when Nixon imposed his uh, wage price controls and uh, the so called NEP New Economic Policy mm. in August fifteenth, nineteen seventy one. We knew this was all about uh, you know the the challenge from Japan and Germany, right? And 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 so, but we thought that the the potential of I mean we were we were hopeful we we have to we we have to be hopeful of course that that we could turn the uh, these global trends these these uh, uh, issues of trade to our own advantage and would be a argument in favor of more. Uh, state collective management of trade mm. and things mm -hmm. of that sort. Right. So we, you know, we, we thought we thought that was still that was possible, and uh, um, uh, you know, so uh, that was part of the you know what, what we were, what, you know, what we. Th I'm trying to think what we thought about. It. Although I have to say, I guess. Well, one thing I'm thinking about yeah. is like factory work. I mean, I, yeah. I, I I was reading some of your work before I got mm. here today, mm. and and you mentioned I think from. 2000, just 2013, the piece that I was reading mm -hmm. of yours that, that basically said, you know, we have this idea that factory work kind of went away, but in fact, there are more people oh, right. working in factories in the well, world right. well, sure. now than ever before. And then, so we are living in an environment right. where, you know, that type of labor is still very much done. Oh, right. In China and, uh, and Central America, you have you know, millions of people on assembly, you know, really, really right. as blue collar assembly. Yeah, the, that, that's right there. It isn't, and, you know, and it's not uh, right here in the U.S., but it's still... A kind of connected system. I mean, that's why in mm -hmm. recent years I've become very interested in supply chains. Right. And I've written about supply chains because that's the that's a way of it's it, it's it's a it's a really an institutional uh, legal financial connection between you know the 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 work the workplace the shop which may be in China now but still it's one it's one unit it's one yeah. unit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean the capitalists have been very clever about this because <laughs> they uh, legally it's not one unit so not our problem you know they they right. say whenever something goes wrong or or whenever they want to shift production from one place to another um, but I think in the 70s um, the, the one argument you could make which you know was that the the left's uh, uh, interest interest proper interest correct interest on cultural uh, uh, racial and gender questions did not prepare them for the economic you know mm. difficulties that mm -hmm. would come you could yeah. make that you could make that argument um, and I think uh, that was that was there, and that, that, and that was to some extent true. Uh, it took a while for the left to begin to think about this in a more systematic. It still fashion. is taking yeah, a while. Yeah, it right, feels yeah, like yeah, it still feels like the left, or it certainly is represented by the Democratic Party. Well, right, uh, well, it's yeah. it's like kind of stuck on those issues, and and in part because the left is, or the Democrat yeah. Democratic Party is to attach itself so closely to neoliberalism right, or whatever yeah. you want to call that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, although, I mean, there were always opposition currents. My, my current project is a history of the Clinton administration, uh, mm. and I'm interested, I am interested in some of these people at the time I was quite contemptuous of because I viewed them as sort of milk toast liberals, people like Robert Reich or yeah. Ira Magaziner or Blue but there, but there was an effort to generate a kind of uh, intellectual and, uh, or, you know, 
a policy opposition to to Reaganism. There was yeah. an effort to yeah. do that, and Bill Clinton was very much part of that. He, you, it's quite easy to attack him, and properly so, for all sorts of, of misdeeds and really capitulation ultimately to the neoconservatives. But he was very much part of this effort to find an opposition to uh, to Reaganism. You know? Well, I always feel, I mean, in my head, I, I, whenever I think of Bill Clinton and his whole you know turn that uh, the Democratic Party took in the nineties, it, it feels. Like I always think of him like Clinton being like we do, we got to win you know we got to win and the way to win is kind of like to try to maybe take some ideas from the right and dress them up and make them sound progressive and make them sound like I think that's partly true I think the other thing about Clinton is that and this is a lot of politicians the 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 labor movement um, has always been uh, you know maybe stolid uh, stolid and maybe you know uh, uh, not uh, you know. But it's been there. It's sort of an anchor that would anchor liberalism. And when yeah. you, don't, you don't have that, then a kind of opportunism just creeps in. So Clinton from Arkansas, yes. you know, so he you know, and Hillary, they, they were liberals. And they, they were civil rights people, that's for sure, mm-hmm. and very good. And they wanted to do all sorts of stuff. But there was no labor movement in Arkansas by the 70s. There had been one earlier. And so it means that what he's trying to do, for example, to improve education and stuff, he, how do you do this without a labor movement, without the troops, mm-hmm. and, 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 and even without the tax base? And, you know, so I think it, 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 it engenders a kind of opportunism, opportunism that's there. And then that, that manifests itself. I think today, uh, in the, in the, well, in, among liberalism in general, you know. Yeah. I mean, just to say the, the, the biggest um, division within uh, kind of, liberalism is uh, substantial numbers of liberals are hostile to um, teacher unionism yeah. in this country. And that's, right. a, that's sort of a, 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 a division within the left, which has manifested itself. Why in many is that different- particularly? Why is that, why is that it, teachers that have... I mean, well, I know well, there's been like a decades of propaganda right, about right, teachers. Right. Well, partly, yeah. Partly the right has, uh, has uh, made that. But the other thing is that the very, for, the immediate, well, for the last couple of decades... All cities in this country, uh, you know, are are in economic austerity. Okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all of them. So any Democrat, good Democrat, who gets elected mayor of any city, right. Villa Garosa in L.A., uh, De Blasio yeah. in New York, uh, you, you name it, they're all going to end up uh, hostile <laughs> or in opposition to the teachers' unions yeah. because it's you know. Th- th- it's a question of a zero sum, you know, game, mm. and uh, mm. I think it's been a brilliant strategy on the part of the right mm-hmm. to starve the cities, and therefore that that creates this division. That's that's part of it. I think there's larger ideological, uh, well, you know, uh, disdain for, um, you know, uh, what they what is now called government schools, you know, yeah, and, and, right. a kind, and a kind of, that kind of element of, within liberalism, which is in some ways quite admirable kind of uh, you know communitarian and and smallish and then you know that that gets picked up by the charter school movement that's know. what i was thinking of yeah. Rahm Emanuel in chicago right, and, right. and, and, Rahm and yeah, even right. obama who said right. a lot right. of positive yeah, things yeah, about yeah. Charter obama schools, was yeah. obama on that as well uh, so th- that's a huge division and i think it will manifest itself over and over again within the within the Demo- within the among liberalism within the democratic party it's kind of amazing to see public education kind of almost like written out of a, yes. as a core tenet of the Democratic Party. I mean, right. it, you're, you're seeing it with, uh, I mean, Nancy Pelosi said, you know, very recently, and people were kind of shocked that, that being pro-choice wasn't necessarily, you didn't have to, you know, it'd be pro, yeah. you could be pro-life and be a Democrat. And it, may, it makes me wonder, like, well, what is the Democratic Party about? What are right. its core principles? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the I think the education thing is, uh, uh, I think she backtracked a little bit on that, on the choice <laughs> question. But yeah, on, the, yeah. edu- on the education thing, uh, the, um, uh, I mean, Hillary did in the last, most recent election, she Partly, I think, you know, she clearly said, I'm aligning myself with, uh, with public education, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm for that. But I have to say, getting back to my own life, in the 1970s, as I said, part of my group ran off to Detroit and spent anywhere from three days to 30 years in the, in the factories. Wow. You know? I mean, and many of them, many of them ended up lifelong uh, 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 people. Some they, some of them rose to union leadership positions. Others just be, remained kind of uh, you know shop stewards and, and militants. The whole labor notes group really came out of that, which I think has done a, done, done very good work. Um, the other side of that though was was education, and uh, here again one of the things that propelled me and others to the left and kind of in a, in a anti not exactly an anti union but a, a kind of 
cynicism was the Shanker leadership of the of the AFT mm. in the nineteen mm-hmm. uh, in the nineteen seventies. And here, Shanker was kind of an original. Well, the nineteen sixty eight. Uh, you know, Ocean Hill, Brownsville in New yep. York City, that was a very ugly thing. Uh, and then he was kind of an early neoconservative. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he really allied himself with Reagan's foreign policy. And then he had, when he when he left, uh, his, his, his uh, successors had that same posture. So that, that created a, 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 a big division on the American left in terms of teacher unionism. Yeah, that makes he, sense. He seemed to symbolize that, you know. You're, you also um, have done some work on Walmart, yeah, right? And yeah. wa- when did Walmart enter your, <laughs> enter right, your kind right. of... Okay. Because, uh, right. you know, I, I, Walmart's come up on the show before because I interviewed yeah. uh, Liza Featherstone, who, oh, wrote, sure. a, who yeah. wrote a book about Walmart. And, yeah. and it's like, I don't know, on the left, I feel like Walmart is kind of the symbol of what capitalism yeah. is in right. America now. Right. Um, right. And w- how did Walmart well, right, come to you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I'm... Proceeding, I write a book on on rank and file revolts. Basically, that's one book, and then my second book was a biography of Walter Ruther, yeah, mm-hmm. the president of the UAW, and of course his great nemesis was General Motors. And so, you know, okay, and I just lectured on on the on the on General Motors yesterday. So General Motors is this big, you know, uh, the, it's kind of a model for all large corporations. If you went to Harvard Business School anytime from 1928 to mm-hmm. 1978, you're going to study Alfred Sloan and how you organize General Motors. This is what you do. You want to be a big businessman? This is what you do. <laughs> and it's in, okay, manufacturing. So, you know, okay, and General Motors has what? I probably it's height 500,000 workers and, 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 and it's the biggest, uh, it's the, the Fortune 500, you know, it's number one, you know. Is it Eisenhower? One president that says like, uh, well, so goes General Motors, so goes the country or something. Uh, like uh, well, that. famously, yeah. what happened was Charles Wilson, who was the president of General Motors, was uh, nominated to be uh, Secretary of Defense in 1953, mm. uh, and he goes to Congress. And so people say to, uh, at the hearings, the, the Democrats ask him, well, Mr. Wilson, uh, is, is there any conflict of interest between your, you, you as, the, as the head of General Motors, which is a big defense contractor, and your new job as Secretary <laughs> of Defense? And he says, well, around GM, we have a saying. What's good for the United States is good for General Motors and vice versa. Wow. It was the vice versa that got him into trouble. Yeah. And yeah. so all the liberals had denounced him for that. And that was a famous moment there. So anyway, the point is that I, I'm, I'm sort of, okay, here's my model. There's, there's General Motors and there's Walter Ruther and they're fighting. Okay. Yeah. So, but around some point in the 1990s or some, or it's sort of, I start, you know, reading the paper and... There's this company in from Arkansas which has more employees than General Motors, mm-hmm. and which uh, is in fact rapidly uh, in, in sales is is looks like it's on a, on a track to outstrip General Motors, and it's militantly anti-union, and it's southern, and it's patriarchal, and it's you know. Like I thought, we were finished with all that. I thought if General Motors was the model, what the hell was this thing doing? Yeah, yeah. This this thing is this thing should be uh, totally marginalized. But instead of being totally marginalized, it's marching steadily into the center of the American political economy. So I, I in the nineties, I, I started thinking about it. And I remember in I was a writing, um, I was one of the writers of the the uh, textbook Who Built America, mm-hmm. which was uh, sort of inspired by Herbert Gutman and yeah. many um, uh, young youngish then. Uh, labor historians were were on its uh, were writers. We were all writers. I remember. I think it was one, probably the second edition or something. I threw in a couple or three paragraphs on Walmart. I said something's going on here, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then, um, in nineteen no two thousand and three, there is a very very large uh, strike in Southern California. I just moved to the University of California, Santa Barbara. I remember this strike at the yeah. grocery stores. Yeah, grocery stores. Yes. And I, I'd been at the University of Virginia for a decade, and I'd moved to the uh, uh, here. And the strike um, in grocery stores, right, the reason the strike took place is because at that time, uh, Walmart had announced that they were going to build, you know, 50 uh, super centers in the, you know, LA area, Southern California area, and the super centers, of course, are, are grocery stores as well mm-hmm, as uh, mm-hmm. as well as uh, general merchandise. So the 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 old line, the other grocery stores, uh, Safeway and Vons and Ralphs and all, and all these stores, they said, 
well, we got to reduce our labor costs because Walmart's coming to town. So they, they basically precipitated this long strike designed to, uh, to, to, to lower labor costs in, in the expectation that Walmart would, would be there. So in the midst of this, someone at the, someone, some, uh, I'm getting phone calls uh, from reporters about this. Uh, the union, the, the United Food and Commercial Workers, is doing a terrible job of explaining why they're, they're fighting Walmart. Anyway, so I'm getting phone calls. And meanwhile, someone, a guy, a, 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 a um, Dick Hebdige, who maybe you've heard of, he was one of the Manchester School of Cultural, um, uh, well, not exactly a story, cult cultural uh, studies people who were interested in, in the in the British nature of the British working class. And it's, mm. he says to me, he was head of the was then the interdis well still the interdisciplinary humanities. Studies. He said Nelson, why don't you have a debate with Walmart? You know? <laughs> so we. We, it, uh, we, we sort of, I called up some Walmart public relations person there, they weren't going to do it. So we ended up having a conference on Walmart, which was very, very successful. Mm. Got covered like an in, academic conference? Yeah, an yeah. academic yeah. conference, yeah. but it was covered in the New York Times and everything. Yeah. And I Where had, was that? Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. And uh, just as the strike was ending, I think I put the conference together in like two months. One of the you know, That's great. anyway, and tremendous interest in it. And I thought, okay, I'll start working on this firm. I, I mean, I, the work it's a working class is still they aren't unionized, they're anti-union, but this is a work, this is a new phenomena, and yeah. let's figure out what's going on. And yeah. I went, I've always thought I want to study the commanding heights of the of the economy and the people who work for them, and if, it, and if it's if it's General Motors in the middle of the 20th century, it's 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 retail. And, and Walmart is still, I think, they're still like the number one employer. In the, in the uh, yeah, States, they're right? the number one employer. Uh, they they don't they no longer are the number one um, uh, uh, by sales, but they're pretty they're pretty they're pretty close. And so I, I got into that. I, I did I did a uh, did a did a collected volume, and then I wrote a book on it. You know, I ended up down there in in yeah. Arkansas. You know, looking wow. Up. So I thought that was and I, that was good. That was good for me because um, it made me start thinking about. The structure of capital, mm, you know, mm -hmm. you know, very, you know, you know, and its relationship to the, the nature of, of working class capacity to resist, and 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 a recently a, a book came out which I. By David Wilde called the fissured workplace, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was a, a business professor at BU, and later uh, and then Obama appointed him head of the wage and hour division, and anyway, and and the, what, what the new what we the new shape of capital in the world is that. That uh, there there are these big entities, but they don't have the same legal or or shape as they did. So therefore, how do you regulate them, unionize them, yeah. you know, etc. And and Walmart is an example of that. I mean, it, it does not own any factories, but mm -hmm. it controls them in in China. And the same is true for Amazon. Uh, you, know, you know, which is now. Yeah, we're, my friend and I were just talking about this on, on a previous episode about how uh, corporations are like the global dreamers and that they get to cross borders, you know, yeah, right, and they, yeah, they right, kind of right, have this right. this really, um, I don't know, kind of amorphous shape to them that right. they can go yeah. anywhere and do anything. Right. There's this sense that they're all powerful and that there's no borders when it comes to right. corporate. And, and then, Whereas and for the, people, it's a lot more restricted. Right. Well, yeah. yes, mobility of capital, and but no, but not mobility of, 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 of workers. That's mm -hmm. a perfect recipe for <laughs> the triumph of capital and the, and the, and the immiseration of the working class. <laughs> yeah, and and right. really, the new, really a new, the new barbarism. I mean, if, you, you know, if, if, if workers are, are, are stuck and the capital can move, I mean, this is just a recipe for... For disaster, um, from the point of view of those who work for a living, um, the um, uh, and, and so yeah, they're, they're very cl clever in manipulating the the nature of ownership, um, mm. and uh, that's what that's why these su supply chains are, are are an important phenomena to to study. And I got involved with that, um, and then also even actually the the efforts by the University of California to to establish a code of conduct which would you know make it at least a little more difficult for these companies to have these sweatshops mm. around the world yeah and then you know so um, uh, yeah but I think that I think that I mean so in a way the frontier of labor history is in fact to study the shape of capital yeah that's what I was kind yeah, of getting yeah, at this, yeah, this kind yeah. of tells yeah. tells the whole story of your work in some ways is that, is that yeah. you know there's this there's this the the branch of labor history that I became familiar with through you know working with Josh Brown the CUNY yeah. Graduate Center and all that is you know Herbert Gutman and kind of social history and kind of looking at, you know very carefully at the rank and file and what their right. culture is like and right. what their families are like right. and what their social life is like and it seems like you've been informed by that but you've also been informed by kind of looking at the larger structure of the business 
Yeah, yeah from, 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 yeah. from from way back. Yeah, from way, from really the first. Yeah, yes, I have. And I think, uh, right, I'm totally not, not just informed, I'm inspired and, and motivated by the nature of, of social history and the nature of thinking about consciousness and how it's created. But, but you know, if you have capital that's mobile, you can sort of kind of a, like dropping a neutron bomb on the on on those worlds. I mean, Jefferson yeah. Cowie showed that in that book, Capital Moves, where you you have, a, you know, he showed the development of consciousness in various towns, uh, you know, in the U.S. And but then when the when the RCA chooses to move, then this leaves these people high and dry. And uh, well, I mean, I was uh, politicized. I mean, I've told this story before in, 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 on this on this program, but the a bit politicized really by like an economics teacher now in high school. Now I see I know what he was doing, but yeah. he showed us uh, Roger and me, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and I mean, now, right, you know, right. being older and looking at Michael Moore and everything, yeah. I kind of like have, you know, yeah. lots of different ideas about what he represents. Right. But the reality yeah. is at 16 years old. I had never thought about the idea that a company could like take over a whole town like Flint, Michigan, and then, and and, and have the whole town kind of strap all its kind of culture yeah, and economics right, and yeah, everything. Right, Social yeah, relations are right. defined by this yeah. company, and then the company leaving, and what a what a massive like n- neutron bomb that is, like you just yeah, talked about. Yeah. That's kind of that's a really kind of hard thing to think about as like a, a, you know, if you're thinking about being like a Marxist or a leftist, kind of how dependent the social structure is and people's livelihoods are to these. Structures right. of the capital that we recognize right. as no, right, yeah, absolutely, and 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 that's sort of the the what we have to feel figure out a way to uh, to to deal with and to uh, to what what points of leverage would the, would the left or, or or historians thinking about what alternatives were possible at various moments, um, uh, and and so that that becomes you know important. I mean, for so for example, just to be specific, <coughs> contemporarily specific. Um, the you know for year i mean my basic posture would have been okay how can a left in the union, the union movement make collective bargaining more successful and you know they could win um so but in the more recent decades collective bargaining yeah it works in some places but basically with mo- capital mobility it doesn't work at all you know it doesn't mm. work so I think the, the fight for 15, the $15 an hour movement has, I mean, has some problems. It doesn't create institutional unions, but, but, but it was a brilliant insight to say, okay, you have to approach this thing by industry, you know, yeah, right. you know across the board. You can't, Fast food you can't, workers. You can't, yeah. you can't think you're going to get a contract at any individual McDonald's. It's not going to work. And the same was true, by the way, for Walmart as well. The, the unions tried for years to, to, you know, to organize a few stores and, and, uh, even if they'd succeeded, it, it, they would have not succeeded because they would have had no impact. Mm. So, you, so we had so we're thinking about new forms uh, of of organization, uh, and uh, I think uh, thinking about ways. How do you actually uh, limit the mobility of capital? And that's a big task, but that is the task that I think the the, 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 the labor movement has to you know confront. focus on capital rather yeah. than yeah. the working I mean, class I, trying to and, win these concessions. And as, and as, a, as an academic, looking thinking about this academically, uh, you're aware that. You know the the new generation of uh, a new generation. I mean, every historians have not neglected capital. <laughs> you know, no, it's no. The, the new the new so called new historians of capitalism think, oh well, we're you know, no, it's not so that so new. But nevertheless, I, I I'm a I support. I'm 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 delighted that that there are all these uh, historians um, uh, who are studying. Um, uh, you know various aspects of, of how capitalism works, from finance to you know to to sales. So my grad students, I I, I, I do. I'm happy to say that, especially when I got out here to California, I was able to attract some grad students who were you know they knew my what I'd done in labor history. They were they were they were on the left. They were radicals. They'd come out of movements and they came here and had several. A couple gen- couple or three generations uh, in the last fifteen or eighteen years. But I find, maybe some people will denounce me for this, but I find that in, they all want to come out and work on the IWW. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, or, and I say, well, let's think about that. And then over time, as they, we, you know, they end up writing uh, uh, more about capital. You know? So I had one mm. student I know who, I hope he, fin- I hope he finishes, is writing a history of General Electric, which I think is very, very yeah. important. And, yeah. and, you know, and you know, why did General Electric move into finance in the 1980s and 90s? Or, or other students have, have studied, uh, one was a former union organizer, and he ended up uh, writing about uh, 
uh, you know, government regulation of, of, of various of the steel industry and you mm. know, things like. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I think it's there's a there's a logic and a reason to why this is now. It's not just a fad, you know. It's not just you know. I think the study, the new historians of capitalism. Yeah, no, right? and and I think that there will be people obviously writing about Silicon Valley, right? Because it yes, seems sure, like sure. that's uh, sure. you know, it's weird because Silicon Valley has this kind of strange cultural place for us oh, sure. now, where we kind of look to them as the, the innovators who bring us these toys, right? That everybody loves, but. No, no, I know. At the same course, time, they're yeah. Uberizing the world, right? Well, sure, yeah. yeah. I, 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 by the way, on, on Uber, I just, I, it was a very good report that came out. So Uber now becomes the sort of icon for the, you know, the, the gig economy. Uh, I, but not to defend Uber in any way, but, but Uber is a product of a pre-existing uh, or, 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 or a Walmart economy. That is, what Walmart and the other service sector firms did, you know, on the food, et cetera, as well, food, food processing, retail, et cetera. Um, th- what they did is they they deconstructed the regular forty hour week. They destroyed that really, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and you know thirty two or thirty four hours and, and plus shorter, longer. You know they destroyed that uh, willy nilly, um, and also lowered wages and and, and you know the the, the re- minimum wage decline. So that meant that you had twenty thirty million people in this country who whose income is quite episodic. Yeah. Even when they have a full-time job. Yep. Uh, and, and therefore... And kind of unknown, like right, unpredictable. Right, right, right. I don't know if I'm going to make 50000 right. this year That's or right. 20000 That's right. That's right. And there was a study made of this, uh, everything from, from, from retail clerks to carpenters to, to everyone. So Uber... In effect, takes advantage of that. Yeah. You know? Okay. Right. You, you you know <clears throat> you don't know, and we will construct we will construct a business model in which you you can you can you know work at it when when you want and you know and, mm-hmm. and, and, and 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 you know in your off hours or something, and <laughs> you know and and they're t- they're taking advantage they're monetarizing in effect that insecurity yeah. that, that people have and yeah. I think I think so so um, but but the but it's pretty crushing I think yeah, so I yeah. think the, the economic yeah. reality for the working class in America yeah. right now is pretty yeah. bad yeah. yeah yeah I mean so yeah and so. Typical indexes don't work anymore. Whether unemployment is four point two percent or something, it doesn't mean anything anymore. I mean, in this sense, Trump is right. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. It's underemployment, or or even, uh, and then of course, uh, the, uh, the wage levels have you know are not responding to the low levels of unemployment. Well, Trump it seems is capitalizing on all the, on a lot of confusion about kind of those, those traditional metrics breaking right. down, right. and and he, right. he capitalizes on people not knowing things and all that. There was right. a you know there was an article uh, uh, an, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times I think yesterday I don't know if you saw it that was about how the Democrats need Wall Street mm. I don't know if you saw this I didn't I it's by I, a Clinton Bill Clinton advisor actually I did not read that actually I did not I did not actually I will I'm not, I will read it but I, I remember seeing the headline and not actually reading it I uh, anyway I should look at that well I mean yeah of course one of the things that has happened is that, I mean this is here I don't want to put too uh, I want to, don't want to sound um, what's the term uh, almost neoconservative mm. on this, but you know, in, for example, I'm writing about uh, the Clinton era and Robert Rubin. Robert Rubin, hmm. you know, is actually in many ways a very attractive figure. <laughs> <laughs> he's a liberal, a social liberal. He's a he's a you know strongly in, in favor of w- women's rights and civil rights. Uh, he you know is a sophisticated guy. He's not crude in any way. Uh, philanthropist in, in, for many of the good things you know you'd like in, in the world. Um, he even has a kind of cynical almost a sort of. Uh, uh, attitude toward you know making tons of money, but you know so he fit in. He fit in nicely. But but his his project was of course uh, a, a very orthodox and neo 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 liberal you know project, which 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 was successful mm-hmm. in the Clinton mm-hmm. era. Uh, but but he but he's he was not a, a you know a, a caricature of a, of a capitalist with a top hat. You know he and so that that kind of. Um, Wall Street world, which gives money for the you know to 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 liberal to liberal things, the cultural side of liberalism. I think right, right. It's there, and uh, you know, um, uh, I'm glad there I'm glad there are people like that. But then their influence is um, is uh, pernicious. Yes. So I I always think oh, you know typically you, you say oh I'm a I'm a social liberal and a and a fiscal conservative. Well, I I I'd almost like to have. I'm a social conservative and a fiscal. <laughs> right, right. I'd rather have and that. And wildly, you know, yeah, almost that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that I think that that's come up on this show before. It's kind of like that idea. Uh, one last thing about Walmart, uh, because yeah. I, I think about like, uh, I don't know, they, it, Walmart <clears throat> almost depends on a strong. I I think you wrote something that intrigued me: the idea that the working class, the, the people that work at Walmart, are exploited by Walmart, but they identify strongly with it. Yeah, they have a loyalty to it. 
Is that how do you yeah. reconcile that? Well, um, the, well, the, well, partly. I mean, partly it was that uh, one of the, the sort of fortuitous brilliance of Sam Walton was he <clears throat> he ended up in Northwest Arkansas, which was a a place that was sort of. The civil rights movement bypassed it. There were no African Americans. The mm. New Deal bypassed it. It was very uh, subsistence farming, and 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 the feminism had nothing to do. I mean, so he 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 sort of had all the technological and and tools of a modern corporation with all the the social values of before the New Deal, and and he right. took advantage of that a kind of paternalism, you know, and mm-hmm. worked. It, it sort of it sort of worked there. I also have what I call the the brick wall theory of social consciousness, which mm. is this: if um, a alternative perspective, and by the way, in at Walmart there were efforts in the seventies. This is not, uh, and even the sixties, seventies to unionize, to do all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. But if those efforts are blocked, and they just seem to be blocked, well, over not so long a bit of time, people will change their minds. Well, I guess we can't do this. Right, you know, right. So that's you know you can't. I'm not going to remain a frustrated unionist for 40 years. <laughs> Are there people, anyone trying to unionize at Walmart well, anymore? Well, well, let me get to that. In yeah, a second. yeah. Let me get to that in a second. So therefore, I will identify with with uh, Sam Walton. And, sure. I mean, and 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 the if you look at the anti-union um, uh, industry. Uh, that's their, 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 that's their, the way they operate, their MO. That is, they say, look, this is impossible for you to get. Mm. Therefore, become a, you know, join us, in right, effect. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, and I mean, I call it, you know, people, people don't want to, you have to be a, I don't know, a, 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 a a grad student, <laughs> a marginal grad student, to keep pushing a, yeah. an idea that, that that isn't winning, you know, for right, for, you know, for right, you, right. Um, so, uh, oh, efforts. Well, there, there was there there had been um, uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers did make a big push to unionize some stores in the late '90s and early. Mm-hmm. Um, and they they were blocked. They were. I mean, Walmart had all the techniques of the anti-union legal industry at its at its, at its side, and they just they were just able to crush it. it legal illegal didn't make any difference because yeah. uh, once a certain amount of time had passed, you know, it was over. Uh, you know, famously in Canada, where the one where in a, in Quebec, which had then a very liberal labor law, one store was organized. They just shut it down. You mm-hmm, know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, and that would that would have been the case in the U.S. where they had four thousand stores. Okay. You know, five percent get unionized. Well, shut them down. They shut down stores anyway. They, yeah, shut, they yeah. even shut down. They have they have an internal um, sort of survey they take a lot of times. And when they find a store that has sort of discontent in it and such, they they will they will shut it down. They will just shut them. It down. reminds me of like public schools shutting down during the civil rights movement because they'd rather yeah. have, they'd rather not have mm, semesters. Well, that's, then. That's, yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, let me say one thing about Amazon. Oh, Amazon and Amazon is. Uh, having an impact on the other retailers. Are they the number one retailer now? Amazon. No, no, yeah. they no, they aren't. No, they aren't. But they're growing very rapidly. Yeah. But here's the thing about Amazon. The last, yes, the actual, the final stage in their supply chain. You know how you actually get the goods is different from that of Walmart. Mm. But the rest of it's all the same. Yeah. In other words, it, it, it's not like Amazon is a different creature. It's just the very last stage. You know, you you click and then it's delivered to your door rather right. than go to the right. But everything else, the the production, the the shipping it over, the big distribution centers, all of that, the the squeeze on suppliers, the whole the rest of the of the uh, uh, logi- uh, kind of organizational infrastructure is the same, and it's exploitative at every kind of stop along that chain, right? right I mean, right, I, right. I always feel like when I order something from Amazon and it comes, you know, virtually five minutes later, that there's there's no way you can pull that off without something, <laughs> well, someone getting screwed. Right. The, yeah, the, uh, the many people thing, getting screwed. Right. And the other thing, about Amazon, uh, I mean, Walmart too, is that you what you have is, and here's where another place for for labor historians, I think, to to enter into the discussion. You have into, uh, new c- companies, um, for, you know, with with which are extraordinarily sophisticated in terms of the technology of uh, production and, and, and distribution, etc. But they use they really are reverting to 19th century forms of labor management. Mm-hmm. So the patron system, 
yeah. you know, which has been written about, you know, which is basically the, the local saloon keeper would hire, you know, 30 of his lawnsmen from, from Sicily and they would mm-hmm. go out and dig a canal or something, you know, and he would be paid, you know, uh, and then, you know, this is the, this is the way Amazon staffs its, its distribution centers. Wow. You know, I mean, the distribution centers are completely tied into your computer. You know, you click and, and instantly they know what, what, what book to, to stick in a cart. But the, the workers are employed by subcontractors and or subcontractors of subcontractors it's it's a it's an it's a 19th century system it's, a, it's funny it makes me yeah. think of like well why is when people say well how is marx still relevant and he's like well oh, the uh, structures of what he was writing about are still the structures absolutely, now right yeah, absolutely just absolutely i mean mark yeah marx is absolutely i mean and and uh, you can read i read the communist manifesto the the, the bourgeoisie goes all over the world just destroying you know yeah. uh destro- destroying all forms and the but i mean but it is i think it's also true um well, it, it, again, again, Walmart takes this. It's. It, I mean, I, I celebrate Sam Walton as an innovator uh, of the same magnitude as Henry Ford. But, well, like Henry Ford to some extent, his social ideas, his 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 his, his image of how the society should be organized was was it was a kind of pre New Deal, you know, mm. retrograde way. Yeah. And uh, so we have we have that everywhere. Elton Musk now at uh, at. Um, uh, who's uh, Tesla? Uh, Tesla. Right? Yeah. He he made a statement which was almost exactly the same statement that the famous um, head of the um, I think it was the Lackawanna Reading Railroad in mm-hmm. 1902. The famous and his name was Bear. I think he said when there was a strike in the Anthracite Fields in 1902. He said the property interests of this country will be are, are, are rightly taken care of by the Christian men and women to whom mm. to, to whom have who have been given this this right. you know, this duty elton musk said when there was an effort to unionize uh, his plan he said we are creating you know an exciting new world how dare these other people subvert that you know yeah, what i mean right you know it was really i thought you know yeah. it was the same thing you know we are the christians we are yeah, the innovators yeah, in effect, i mean they, yeah. we didn't use christianity but we are right. the, we are the technological well innovators. the innovators are the christians right now, yeah. right yeah. yeah and how dare how dare this other group and um, they have a they have a, a social vision yeah, yeah. right right yeah. I, I i i right right that's exactly that's right absolutely i there was and a, some people are in it and some people are kind of like <laughs> cogs in the machine right that's right right yeah. or, or, or more than worse than that, in the same way that the labor movement was viewed as you know uh, loom breakers and and mm, and, and, mm-hmm. and 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 sort of uh, retrobates and uh, and <laughs> later on as just in, inexorably conservative and, and stolid. That's what that's what Musk was. Yeah, what, is Musk is. I Musk. Is I pronounce yeah, Musk. Yeah, Musk. Musk. Elon Musk. Well, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. By the way, I had a, a friend, a sociology friend. He's who, awful, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> a sociology yeah. friend who was doing a study of diversity in Silicon Valley. And she made the point, just to knock on Silicon Valley, that throughout the, the whole country, um, you know, one of the great triumphs of the civil rights movement is that, you know, everyone pretty much gives lip service to, you know, uh, I mean, well, not the not the alt-right today, but pretty much a lot of other people, you know, lip service to, you know, diversity mm-hmm. and civil rights and, you know, and the, and not discriminate, you know, and, but in Silicon Valley, um, when you raise the question of why don't we have more Latinos or African Americans, more diverse, they'll say, "What are you talking about? We have incredible ethnic diversity. We got Belarusians, we got Israelis, we right, got Lithuanians. Right. Yeah. You're being parochial to talk uh, about, you know, Latino, Latinos. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and so there's a kind of almost a uh, they aren't even defensive about it. They, it's, it's really it's complicated the, the way that all works because it makes me think that like the alt the alt right who's you know they're the ones that that are opposed to. All, the part of the, I think what they say is that is that when when liberals talk about diversity, it is just lip service, right? Mm-hmm. Like it isn't like it doesn't yeah. really have a yeah. substance to it. I don't think the alt right well, wants the, it to well, have the, a well, substance to it. Well, the whole diversity it, idea, I mean, that's actually a, that is a conservative way of framing mm-hmm. um, affirmative action or even or civil you know civil rights. That was sure. that came out of the Powell uh, on the Supreme Court in, in 1979, and mm-hmm. so it's it's a it's a more conservative way of. Framing it, I mean, I, I do think this question of the of the Trump world. Um, I mean, I think you know uh, this is going to be this is a battle. This, he's not going to self destruct, mm. and his support is it's a minority support, thirty or but it's rock solid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's something the left and liberals have to have to understand. That's rock solid, and. Hmm. Uh, Clearly, what's happened is a a very 
imbricated and and tight knit connection between economic insecurity and just and racism. And yeah. those two things have been pulled together in a in a in a web, which is really difficult to kind of uh, to un, to untie. You know. I agree. I agree. Um, uh, so I think I think to I mean let me just say this yeah sure uh, I am quite annoyed with the liberal programs on TV the racial <laughs> Maddows who yeah me too <laughs> who who correctly go on oh you know, another disastrous thing that Trump said etc this is not this is not a point this is not going to going to succeed the divide divide uh, the Trump forces are it's hardly even mobilizing the liberal forces I think that we clearly need a a, a positive. Uh, uh, thought out agenda mm-hmm. uh, for you know the, the the left to run on and we should just it can't just be him sticking his foot in his no. mouth because it, no. it actually those things i think strengthen his appeal to his base i, I mean agree. when he goes and does that you know i'm going to totally agree. destroy north korea and the liberals on tv tend to act like well that's it for him yeah, he'll never right. survive this no, I know. I think i'm we, like what are you talking about that yeah. was calculated and right. uh, probably yeah, we got to get over political that. victory we, we got to get over that we got to get over that because you know that's not, there's nothing he's going to do no there's no latest scandal that's going to really you know right. be, be the end and as long as he has that 35% solid base the, the rest of the republican party will hang in there with him and we just we have to we have to create a uh, alternative uh, uh, you know, positive, uh, dynamic vision that's going to, you know... Do you think Do you think that um, the success of Bernie Sanders during the 2016 was kind of an indication that, that, that it's possible to build something like that? Well, it's one, one thing, I mean, again, growing up in the... Um, in the 70s and 80s, being an you know, intellectual in the 70s and 80s when the Cold War and sort of remnants of uh, socialism being defi- being right. identified with communism. And that was something really that was very strong in the, in the 60s when I got to Berkeley, that, that idea. Um, clearly, uh, the end of the Cold War, one benefit is that, you know, the, 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 the detoxification of the word socialism. So yeah. we could yeah, yeah. use that. And that's a good idea. Um, Young people, I think, have a more positive uh, kind of ideas about socialism than, right. than, than many right. different pre- right. previous generations. So I think that that's a very good thing. Um, on the other hand, I have to say, Bernie, for, for again, again, like Clinton in Arkansas, in a way, I think Bernie, uh, as a politician in Vermont, uh, where there wasn't much of a labor movement, he he constructed his liberalism or socialism without putting you know the the organized working class at the center of it you know mm-hmm. and i think that was manifested in his campaign yeah. I, I he he was on he did the right things he showed up on picket lines and he gave out the shout outs to the unions but that was not something that he would he could he could he would put he would say you know in a definitive fashion and well, see, maybe it's and, kind of a hybrid campaign. He was trying yeah, to kind of appeal to yeah. Hillary voters too, and it seems like Hillary voters aren't super union people. Well, no, well, right. I mean, you know, I mean, except I mean, for the, I mean, the, 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 the establishment. I think one of the some of the great scholarship of recent recent years two of twofold. Um, one is uh, from the point of view of um, uh, so, some sociologists have shown you know have shown that the reason that uh, if you're in a union. Um, you 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 did or you did maybe you still do, tended to vote in a kind of more social democratic fashion was not because the union was was sending out your brochure mm-hmm. in the mail or something <laughs> uh, it was because the just functioning in a collective fashion educated people to the meaning of collectivity mm, yeah. and that you know it wasn't some you know and that was important it certainly wasn't you know the checks that you wrote to politicians and the second side of it is on on the on the race question. Um, Despite the uh, uh, unquestioned um, racism, both either actually straight out or 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 sub- more subtle, of of you know the, the the many of the unions over the over the century and many of the the white uh, uh, workers who were in them or the Irish or you know Jewish leaders or whatever they had, um, African Americans understood that they had a more fortuitous. Um, or, or a more strategically advantageous ground upon which to fight mm. in the unions, even though even when the unions themselves had all sorts of problems. And so, some wonderful uh, scholars, including Rule Schiller, who's a legal uh, guy at uh, Hastings, have done these studies of, of right to work, for example. Yeah. And, and African Americans have always been against right to work. They understand mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. You know, even even though even though the ideology of the right to work committee going back to the fifties. I mean, the right to work came out of the the, the segregation of South. Yeah, they were the they were they were hard, they were the worst you know elements of, of that. That makes sense. Yeah, but almost by 1959, 
uh, he was 60, the right to work was project, ideologically project, rhetorically projecting itself as a civil rights. It worked for civil rights for mm, African American yeah. workers who are being oppressed by racist unions. I mean, this is, you know, and uh, so he, despite all those generations of that uh, rhetoric, the African Americans never bought that, and the Latinos either. And so mm. the, the union movement is, is, a, is essential uh, to the. Uh, well, the revival, not just of, I mean, of the working class standard of living, but of, of liberalism and the and the one of the great failures of the of Democrats uh, is not to understand that their fate uh, is is linked to the, the unions, and they're going to yeah. keep losing, or you know, unless unless you have that. And well, I mean, it's 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 it should, anyone who knows the history of the 20th century should should know that because it seems so obvious that the Democrats succeeded, you know, mm -hmm. and having this kind of like domination of national politics and it's during the, the, the same period yeah, that they right, were kind of very right. close to labor. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, even during the, the eras of, of when labor seems quite conservative and, and, and I start writing books, you know, basically essentially denouncing the leadership, the very existence of it <coughs> meant that it, it, it created the certain pri pri parameters in which politics was possible yeah. and other things yeah. weren't. And uh, so, I mean, that, and that, by the way, uh, uh, the late Judith Stein, um, yeah, she was uh, uh, she yeah, was one right, of my professors right. at the graduate she's, center. Yeah, she's terrific. Yeah, she she running steel, running America. Right, that yeah. was a very good. And then mm -hmm. also her book on uh, from factories to finance. She makes mm -hmm. the point that in the seventies, despite the fact that George Meany was a very unattractive figure, mm -hmm. uh, certainly to uh, lots of Democrats and the left, of course. Nevertheless, his his you know. Keynesianism, uh, you know, and plan, sort of planning <laughs> slash Keynesianism, in fact, was was what uh, what we needed, you know, and um, uh, and and you know, and then that that being sort of cast aside by the Carters and others meant that uh, it, it had this, it opened the door to to capital, uh, the freedom for, of capital to yeah, do whatever yeah. we wanted. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for joining me. I've learned so much from your ideas over the years, and so much from talking to you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome indeed. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank my guest, Nelson Lichtenstein. I had a wonderful time talking with him. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and the things that he has to say. Um, he's got a wealth of historical knowledge, but also he's just a really, really fun guy to talk to. So I, I hope to bring him back on the show again and talk, to, talk more deeply about some of the, uh, the stuff he has to say about labor because he's got a really great, great handle on the whole history and, and where, where we've been and where we've headed. So I hope you enjoyed that. Go to patreon.com slash nostalgia trap to donate to the show if that's something that you can do. I would really be happy about that. Thanks again, and I will talk to you soon.